Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation, Coop Kitchen. Let me start by telling you this. I'm a bit of a foodie. I mean, I love good food. I love, I love uh, food TV shows. And uh, when I first started playing around with Kubernetes, my first reaction was bloody hell. Which immediately made me think of Gordon Ramsay uh, in Hell's Kitchen. So the original talk was, uh, their talk title was Kubernetes Hell's Kitchen. Um, I had to change it because I don't have the rights to uh, <laughs> display pictures of Gordon Ramsay here. But, but the first time I looked at Kubernetes, it, was, it, was, it seemed so complex. There were so different concepts, different things that I didn't understand. And I mean, in, in my career, I was able to do various things, a lot of different things. I jump on multiple projects and, and I've been a programmer for many years now. And I'm able to jump into a project and learn a new language very easily. But this whole DevOps thing was completely new to me. So it took me, it took me a little while to understand all the different concepts that you need to understand in order to get started with Kubernetes. But as I was looking into it, it turns out that, oh, it's not that complex. So the only thing that Kubernetes does basically is it will take containers and spin them up or down depending on your load and it will take care of making sure that they commu can communicate to each other. That's it. That's all it does. So it's that simple. We can stop the presentation here. Thank you very much. Um, no, more seriously, that's, that's pretty much all it does. But there's a lot of different concepts that it introduces and there's a lot of very specific vocabulary to Kubernetes. So my goal for this presentation is to introduce you to those basic building blocks that you'll need if you have to uh, spin up a Kubernetes cluster just so that you have enough information and just enough knowledge so that you'll actually be able to know what you need to Google when you run into it. So this is what we'll do today. I'll introduce you to those basic concepts and we will deploy an application into a Kubernetes cluster as we move along into this presentation. So with this, let's get started. So let's talk about what problems Kubernetes solves for us. So Kubernetes will take care of distributing the containers in a logical and efficient way. So I've already hinted on that, but it will take care of putting all of your different containers on different machines and it will take care of doing that in a way that no server will be more overloaded than another one. It will also take care of scaling up and down your various containers. So if you have a sudden burst of traffic on your website, it will be able to you know, increase the, the, the number of containers so that you'll be able to answer to those requests in a better fashion. It will also make sure that you keep all of your processes continuously working. That is very important. So it'll take care of doing checks uh, time to time, and it will ensure that you always, always have the number of containers that you need running at any given time. And all of this is done by using YAML files. So it's simply uh, configuration files that you'll you know, apply on your cluster, and it will take care of doing all of that processing. So <laughs> take my money, right? It solves all of my problems. This is what I need. Um, so does it? Well, maybe not. So maybe your application is a little bit more like this, right? It, it does one thing at a time. You don't have millions of users, but you want to make sure that they are served in a timely fashion. Maybe you joined the Jamstack movement and you have a static website, or maybe you have a WordPress or a Laravel application. Well, in that case, the food truck model is probably better suited for you. An application can be hosted on Netlify, GitHub pages, or any virtual host. This will ensure that your application is stable and you won't have to worry about it. It makes it easier to maintain um, and it doesn't get into the way of your work. So it's very, very easy to use and to maintain. But maybe you have a pizzeria. You have a small shop with a relatively simple workflow. You know, one person at the cash and one person in the kitchen. So it's kind of like, you know, you have a startup there. <laughs> See what I did? So you've got a front end and a back end. Uh, not too many customers, but you can start putting some best practices in place. You can start using containers to deploy your application, but you can still probably very easily use something like Heroku to handle this. Uh, it'll integrate very easily with your workflow again, and it'll make it easy um, to scale up once you actually need to. Or maybe you have a buffet. Everything is right there, ready for your customers to use. They take something and then they just leave it for the next one. Do you see what I did there? Serverless, <laughs> so kind of like a serverless architecture there. There's no real heavy lifting and you need small operation. 
There are ways to do serverless using uh, Kubernetes, uh, but that's a little bit more complex and I'm not gonna cover that in this presentation. But if you do serverless, there's a lot of very good alternatives for you. You can use Lambda functions or Azure functions as well. But if you have an upscale restaurant, that's different. You'll need multiple staff members. Everybody has a very specific role. Some people are allowed to talk to others and some aren't. These processes are a lot more complex. A single plate might require the input from many cooks and you can't have a single point of failure. You need all those parts at any given moment. And this is where Kubernetes will come in. It'll ensure that all the people in the floor know where the other people are and how to talk to each other. So it will really help with all those different lines of communication and also making sure that there's always the necessary staff in place. So what does Kubernetes does? Well, it'll take care of deploying more or less containers depending on what you need. It'll take care of distributing the load. So making sure that uh, the, the containers are distributed in a way that makes sense for your servers and it will take care of all the networking for you. So in order to see all of this, we're gonna open a new restaurant. So hopefully you're ready for our grand opening. But first, let me just quickly introduce myself. So hi, my name is Joel. I work as a developer advocate for the Red Hat OpenShift platform. OpenShift is Red Hat's distribution of Kubernetes. So everything that I'll show today, you can actually use in OpenShift or you can use directly on Kubernetes as well. Oh, I usually have stickers with me. Uh, unfortunately, this being a virtual event, uh, it's not as easy to give you some, but if you ever run into me in a conference, I'll be more than happy to provide with you use with some stickers. Um, I love Twitter. So if you ever wanna get in touch with me, that's always the best way. So you've got my Twitter handle right here. So that's Joel with two underscores, Lord. Um, I know it's a weird, a weird handle there, uh, but Joel underscore underscore Lord, that's the best way to find me. Whenever I have a Twitter notification, I get really, really excited. Uh, and of course, I mean, I, I do gifts with myself. You don't want to miss that. Right? <laughs> okay, so back to our topic. We will open a restaurant. And what will we serve at this restaurant? Well, we will serve poutine because, because that's my French Canadian heritage right? But we won't serve just any poutine. We'll serve upscale poutine, like a, a foie gras poutine or, or this amazing duck confit poutine, uh, which is served in a local restaurant uh, near my place. So if you ever need food recommendations and you're near Ottawa, let me know because I have a list of good places to go. So uh, this is what we're open. So the first thing we'll want to do to open our restaurant is to find a place. We'll need a location, and not only do we need a space, but we need to make sure that it has all the, the required facilities. So our space will obviously need some electricity and some, some gas for our ovens. And ideally, we'll already have some walls uh, already up and, and maybe even a kitchen. And of course, we don't want to build all of this, right? We will probably want to find a place and rent it, find a place that is already suited for our restaurant and just rent out that place. When we rent out the place, we will sign an agreement with the owner. The owner will guarantee all the different resources. It will take care of you know, fixing any issues that we might have in the rented place and so on. So this is kind of like our Kubernetes cluster. Just like we rent out our retail space, we can rent out a Kubernetes cluster. Major providers has those in place for you. Uh, Azure, Google, DigitalOcean, of course, Red Hat, OpenShift, and IBM Cloud. Standard tooling can be used to manage those tools, but they all have their little, little distinctions and little different ways to interact with things. As we progress through this presentation, I'll try to highlight some of those little differences as we encounter. So your cluster will have various nodes to it. Nodes are essentially physical or virtual machines that will be running in this cluster. Our first type of node that we'll be talking about is the worker node. The worker nodes will be where our containers will be hosted. In my case, I'll be using a Minikube, which is a, a small, lightweight uh, Kubernetes distribution that you can run on your laptop, and it will run a single worker node in this case. But normally, you could have multiple nodes, and your, and your cluster will distribute the different containers on those various nodes. So for a restaurant, everything is going to run into this single node. Now, you also need a master node, one or multiple master nodes. The master nodes will be in charge of dispatching and, and placing the containers on the various worker nodes. 
it will distribute them in a logical and efficient manner. You can have multiple master nodes as well. It will ensure that you always have a backup. So if one of them fails, then you have another one that can take up. So it's kind of like our owner at this case, right? So the owner will be in charge of fixing everything that is broken and making sure to dispatch to our rented, rented space. All right, so let's start our cluster now. As I mentioned, I'm gonna use Minikube in this example. So you can take a look at uh, the GitHub page for Minikube. Great little project, you can use it. Run a, a Kubernetes cluster in your machine. Uh, it doesn't take up too many resources, so it's very, very efficient as well. So in order to start your cluster, you will use Minikube start. That's the command to get it started. And that's all you need to do. It does take one or, one or two minutes to get started. So I've started mine already. And next we'll need a staff. We'll need a bunch of different people for our restaurant. All those people will have very specific expertise and we will need to explore them. In here we have uh, our chef, we've got a manager, we've got our maitre d', we've got our waiters, we've got some cooks and so on. And as it gets busy and busy, we will need more and more staff. Now they can't work all the time, so we'll kind of need to replace them from time to time. But without them, nothing works, right? So really, our staff is what we need to run our restaurant. And just like our staff, the pods are the workers in our cluster. They're composed of normally one container that will do a specific job. I say normally, sometimes you can have more than one container, but for now and for the purpose of this talk, let's just assume that container equals pod. So they live on the nodes and they can be destroyed at any moment to be replaced by another one. In order to find them, we will need to use labels. In fact, all the Kubernetes objects use labels a lot. It helps you to find the different objects inside your cluster. So most of the staff in our next examples will be represented by pods. Now, you can't just let your waiters work whenever they want. Some of them will be too greedy and they'll start working too much and others will only come on Fridays and Saturdays where they can actually make some decent money. If you have too few of them, well, your customers will suffer. Or if you have too many of them, then it will cost you too much money. So you'll need to schedule them. And that's a job for a maitre d'. I said most of our staff will be pods. The first exception is our maitre d' here. The maitre d' job is to ensure that everything goes roundly. And in order to help with that, she'll make schedules. So this introduces deployment. So our maitre d' is kind of a deployment inside our Kubernetes cluster. A deployment is an API object that manages a replicated application. Each replica is represented by a pod, and the pods are distributed among the nodes of a cluster. So a deployment is a way to describe the plan for how many pods we want, how many we need, where we need them, and so on. And it uses a replica set to ensure that the configured number of pods are running into your cluster. So it'll make sure that you always, always have X number of pods running at any given time. Now, I already mentioned everything in Kubernetes will be using YAML files, and YAML files always have the same structure. So you have an API version, you have a kind, you have the metadata, and you have the spec, which is pretty much where everything goes. So in order to create our first deployment, we'll have something a little bit like this. First of all, API version will use the apps version one, and we will create an object of kind deployment. Then we'll need to specify some metadata. So we'll specify the name of this deployment. We'll call it front deployment for front of the kitchen, right? And then we'll specify our labels. So labels will help us to find our different applications or jobs or sections inside of our Kubernetes cluster. So you can specify whatever you want inside the labels. In this case, I'm gonna say, this is part of the application Coop Kitchen. This label is associated with a job of maitre d', and it's in the front of the restaurant. And now let's go to our spec. Our spec is where it gets a little bit more complicated. First thing we'll want to specify inside a deployment is the number of replicas that we want. So in this case, we want to make sure that we always have three waiters running. So we'll have three replicas of the following pod, and we will match them based on the selector job equals waiter. Each one of those pods will follow the template that is specified right here. So we have our template. Our template also has some metadata, so we'll specify the different labels. So very similar to the one that we did for the Metro D, but in this case, it has a job of waiter. And now the spec of our pod. 
So we have a container and we will take that specific image that was already deployed into my registry and we'll call them front. Now I also need to specify that this container, this specific container will run on port 80 so that Kubernetes knows how to communicate with it. So this is my YAML file. So there's a lot of stuff in there. I promise you, this is probably the most complicated that we'll see today. Uh, but there's a lot of different things that you need to specify, but now you have your deployment. This will make sure that you always have your pods running or your containers running for your waiters. So let's start by taking a look. So in here, um, I have access to a terminal. Oops, let's just ignore that. <laughs> All right. Um, Okay, so I have my kubectl command line tool that I'll be using. kubectl is the way that you will interact with your Kubernetes cluster. If I do a get all, I can see what is currently running inside my Kubernetes cluster. And for now I have, well, I have one service for my Kubernetes cluster, but essentially I have nothing running. So I have the YAML file that I've just shown you already uh, prepared. So I'll just deploy that. So I'll use kubectl apply dash F and it's in my front folder and it's called deployment. There it is. All right, so let's use that. So now we can see that this deployment has been created. Now if I do kubectl get all again, you can see there's a lot more things now. So you can see that I have a bunch of different pods so right at the top there. I've got three pods running. So that's because my deployment specified that I wanted three pods at, at any given time. You can also see that I have my deployment. Uh, so my deployment is our plan or our schedule. So this is what our maitre d' uh, puts in, in place in order to specify that he wants three waiters at any given time. And then you also have the replica set. The replica set will make sure that you always have those uh, pods running. So let's try to do something now. Let's say what we have a sudden burst of traffic. We've got a lot of people coming in. So our maitre d' will need to call in a new waiter. So how would you react to that? So we'll use kubectl again, kubectl, and we'll say scale replicas, replicas equals five, because there's a lot of people coming in. So we need five waiters now. And we'll use our deployment, front deployment. Boom, scale, that's it, kubectl. Get all, let's take a look at this. There you go. We now have five waiters on the floor running all over the place and trying to help those customers. So scaling up and down, that easy. Just put in a scale and you can put up more containers. Let's get it back to three. So kubectl, scale, replicas, three, deployment, front deployment. Oops, I must have made a typo. Let's try this again. kubectl, scale, dash dash replicas, three. And this will be for our deployment, front, deployment, deployment, deployment. All right, so we're back to three. So if we do kubectl, get all, we can see that we are now back to three pods. Good. So we can now see how we can easily spin up and down different waiters. And this is actually connected to my uh, Kubernetes API. So Kubernetes has an API that you can actually uh, query. And we can see here that I have my three waiters running. So if I just open up a terminal and I'll open up in another window so you won't see this, but if I use kubectl and I'll do a scale again and replicas equals five. Deployment front deployment. There it is. You can see that those, those two new, you can see that, you can see that those two new pods were just added and it took a few seconds. You, you might've seen it very quickly it was in blue and now I switched to green. That's because it is good to go. So it's working. So if you want to switch back to three again, let me just put in three here and there it is. You should see two of those uh, pods die down. So just a few seconds. There you go. So we're now back to three pods running. So that's nice and all. So our maitre d' now knows that now has three waiters on the floor. So that's good. Um, and we can put in some, some more waiters if we need to. But we have a small problem here. 
there's no way for us to find the waiters on the floor. You know, there's, there's no way to know if it's John or Simone who are working tonight. You don't know where they are. One is cleaning a table, another one is dusting some flowers in the back, and another one is staring at a glass. God knows what he's doing. Uh, so you've got all those waiters doing different things, but there's no way to communicate with them. And this is where a service will come into play. So a service is an abstract way to expose an application running on a set of pods as a network service. So that's the definition from Kubernetes. What does that mean? Well, it acts as a way to find your different pods inside your cluster. So you can communicate directly with the pods if you want, but it's really hard to keep track because pods will get started and they'll, then they'll go down each time they're created with a random name. So there's no way to really keep track of how are of how to communicate with those pods. So the service will be there to help you. It'll also do all of the load balancing for us, which is great. So you don't have to worry about load balancing. It'll take care of finding an available waiter for you and then just communicating, making sure that you can communicate with him. So to create our service, we'll have once again, a YAML file, very similar structure once again. So we'll have API version one, we'll create an object of kind service. And then we'll need some metadata. So our metadata will have the name. So it will be called front service. It will have various labels to it. Uh, so we'll uh, specify that it's for the application Coop Kitchen and it's for the front of our restaurant. Now the spec of our service will be to find all the pods that have a job waiter, right? So we'll try to match all those labels to job equals waiter. And then it will have a port, which will be open to port 80. And that port 80 will be able to communicate with one of the waiters. So it'll take care of balancing between the different waiters and so on and it does all of that for you. So this is what our service YAML looks like. So let's go ahead and deploy this service. So we'll use kubectl again. And if we do a get service, you can see that while we have this Kubernetes service running, so let's just go ahead and apply dash F and this will be our front service. Good, so it's created. So if we do a get service again, you can see that we now have this service called front service at the top there. So if we do a kubectl get all, and we can use a label, so dash L, so dash L, section equals front. So now we can get everything that matches a specific label. So we'll get everything in the front of our restaurant. So we've got our three waiters, the three front deployment. So we've got our three waiters. We've got, we've got a deployment. We now have a service as well, as well as our replica set, who is, which is still there. So our Metro D now knows where his waiting staff is. That's good. But as a customer, you need to talk to your waiter, right? You won't go in the kitchen and order your food by yourself. Uh, the cooks probably won't like that. So the waiter is your door into your system or your front end, if you will. So we'll now introduce the concept of an ingress. An ingress is an API object that manages external access to the services in a cluster, typically HTTP. Ingress can provide low balancing SSL termination and name-based virtual hosting. So it can do a lot of different things. What does that mean exactly? Well, an ingress will expose your cluster to the outside world. So basically well, it'll be one route so that you can actually access the various services inside your cluster. It can support multiple sub paths and so on, and it will route the request based on the actual request. So it'll be able to dispatch into different services based on the definition of your request. So let's look at our YAML file. So we'll have an object of uh, type or, or of kind ingress. We have our metadata once again. So we've got our name, we've got our labels, and now we've got our spec. So it'll have a spec of backend service name, front service. So we'll say our ingress will go into this front service that we've just created on port 80. And that's our YAML file. So let's deploy that one as well. kubectl apply dash F. So our front and our ingress. All right. So our ingress was created. If we do a kubectl get ingress, We can see that it's there. And now we can take a look at, at their current architecture. You'll notice that we still have the same amount of waiters on the floor, 
But now at the front, you might notice that there's a maitre d' right there and it's there's an ingress serving on port 80. So that port 80 is our way into our cluster for our customers. So I am now a customer. I get into the restaurant. I have this application that is served to me. And well, we've got our waiter greeting us. So hi, my name is a front deployment. Uh, and then you can see there's uh, this random number here. If I try to refresh this page, let's just do a reload. You can see that 5BJPL was changed. And if I try again, 95SGD. So you can see this is the load balancing uh, getting working there for you. So we've got our waiter greeting us. Uh, and the first thing he'll ask us, well, what, are, what can I help you with? And you can order drinks. Well, actually, well, we can order drinks right now. And why is that? Well, we don't have any bartenders yet. So we've got our waiters, but the first thing we'll want to do is to order a drink, right? So we'll need to set up a bar. Now, bartenders are notoriously known for not being reliable. So between the drinking and flirting, you know, they can be hard to find. So in order to help with this, we'll need a service to help us find them on the floor. And we'll also need a way for our waiters to be able to talk to our, our bartenders so that they can order the drink at the bar and then they can bring it back to you. So, first of all, we'll need a deployment. The deployment for our bartenders is very similar to the one for our waiters. As you can see here, it has uh, the API version, the kind of deployment and so on and so on. The spec will change a little bit. The main difference being that we will use a different container because our bartender service is a little bit different or our bartender microservice is a little bit different than the waiter service. Now we will also need a service in order to find our bartenders on the floor, but we'll also add a node port to our service. What is a node port? Well, it exposes the service on each node's IP at a static port. So a cluster IP service to which the node port service routes is automatically created. So what does that mean? Well, the node port is part of the service uh, it works well when there's a single node, so you can actually access that node directly. If you have multiple nodes, then it won't work for you. So it's not necessarily recommended for most cases. It's just one different way to uh, show you how to access different services on your cluster that I wanted to highlight today. So providers will have different ways to create different routes. A uh, node port is one way, an ingress is one. OpenShift also introduces the concept of routes. So you'll kind of have to look at your documentation in order to figure out how to access your services from the outside world. So our service for our bartenders will look a little bit like this. So we've got an object of type service. You can see here in the spec that I have a spec of type node port in this case, and I will expose the port 3000, which is the port on which my bar service or my bar server is running. And I'll expose it on the node port 31300. So let's go ahead and deploy our service and deployments. So I'll use kubectl again apply dash F, I'll use my bar and deployment. So there it is. So we've created our deployment. Let's also go ahead and apply our service. So bar service, there it is also created. So now we can take a look at kubectl get all pods. I'm sorry, we can do kubectl get pods, not all pods. And now you can see that we have multiple pods and we not only have our three bartenders like we had before, but we also have those two new bar pods. So our two bartenders are now there. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, our bartenders are not always reliable, right? So let's say we've got uh, one of our bartenders and let's list all of our bartenders here. So kubectl get pods and we'll match by label. So job equals bar. Oh, I'm sorry, it's bar man. There we go. So we've got our two pods running here. And let me just take one of those ID. And let me copy this. And now I'll do kubectl delete, delete pod. And use the pod ID. There we go. So this one deleted. And this will take a few seconds. So we'll try to gracefully uh, destroy our pod. So we'll just wait a few seconds for this to happen. And there it is, it's gone. So now if we look at our bartenders again, so we can see that we still have two of them. So what happened there? Well, you'll notice that the two IDs are different. One of them was there for a while and you can see that it's been running for over three minutes now. And the other one has only been running for 45 seconds now. 
So as soon as one of those spots was deleted, Kubernetes took care of spinning up a new one so that you always have those two containers running at any given time. Good, so this is what we currently have. So we now have our waiters uh, greeting us at the door, welcoming us, and we can talk to them using our ingress on port 80. And then the, the waiters can actually talk to our bartenders through that node port. So they'll be able to communicate. And we have our two bartenders there ready to serve our drink orders. Okay, so we can go back to our application. And in here, we can see that we've got our waiter greeting us just like it did before. And now I can go ahead and order my drink. So you can see that it was served by a specific bartender. If I try, there's probably one that crashed again, one that wasn't reliable and went somewhere else, but it should be doing the load balancing as well. And you should be able to see different waiters or different bartenders serving us our drinks. Okay, right, so we now have our waiters as well as our bartenders, and it's now time to go into the kitchen where the real work happens. Now, a lot of people tend to think that there is a single chef preparing the food behind there, but it's not entirely true. There's a bunch of people doing a bunch of different things. Now, each one has a designated station and they follow the orders of the chef. Those cooks are usually easily replaceable and they'll even change place sometimes during the course of a shift. But the chef always know where they are. So can you see where we're going with that? Of course, so we'll start by creating our cook deployment. Our cook deployment will be very similar once again to both our waiters and our bartenders. They will be using a different container, of course. Our service will be pretty much the same as we had for our bartenders. So let's go ahead and deploy both of our uh, cooks and uh, for the deployment and the service. So we'll use kubectl apply dash f kitchen cook deployment. There you go. And now let's also do kubectl apply dash f kitchen cook and our service. Good. So let's take a look at what we have right now. kubectl get all. And you can see that we have a bunch of different things now. So we've got all at the top our pods for our waiters, for our bartenders, for our cooks now. So we've got a lot of different things running on our cluster. So let's take a look at the actual cluster and see what it looks like uh, according to our Kubernetes API. So as you can see now, we have our front, uh, our waiters at the front, uh, which are served by our Metro D, where we can find them as customers. They can talk to the bar, but now we have an issue. We've got our cooks, but there's no way to communicate with that cook. So this is what brings us to our chef. So this is, then there's normally only one inside of our kitchen and the chef will dispatch the orders to the cooks and then take all the elements and do the final assembly. He'll bring the final little touch, that little flower on top of your plate. So he'll give the final approval to the plate. The chef is also the gatekeeper to the kitchen. If the customers or God forbid the waiters were to go ahead and talk to the cooks, it would be a nightmare. Nobody would know what to do and so on. So our chef will be there to be in charge of communicating with the cooks and also to the waiters. So we need a, a way for our waiters to be able to communicate with the kitchen. So we will deploy our chef now. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, that YAML file is a lot longer. And there's a reason for that. It's because I am deploying multiple objects inside a single YAML file. So you can do them by separating with the dashes. As you can see, they're near the bottom. So it's just about at this height there. So let's go ahead and deploy our chef. So very similar to the other deployments that we've done before. So we'll use kubectl, apply kitchen chef multi. About that multi.yaml. There you go. And we can see that both the deployments and the service were created. So if we do kubectl get all dash l job equals chef, we can now see that we have a deployment and a replica set for our chef. So what does this look like now? So let's take a look at our architecture now. So we see that we have more stuff in there. So we've got our waiters, uh, which we can communicate with through port 80. 
Um, in there, we've got the waiters that can talk to the bartenders. We also have our waiters that can now talk to the chef and the chef will be able to talk to the cooks. You'll notice here that there's no port associated with the cooks and it says internal only. And I'll show you just in a second how we can actually do that internal communication. But first, let's see if we can now finally get our order in. So we've got our waiter greeting us. We can actually go ahead and order some drinks. So I've got a beer that was served by the bartender. I can now go ahead and order my main course. So can I have my fancy poutine? And there it is. So you can see that I've got all the different elements here. I've got some fries that were prepared by a specific cook. So X5, XP2 in this case. We've got the cheese curds, fresh cheese curds that were prepared by our second cook, or actually by the same cook in this case. We've got a sauce, so we need a very good demi-glace poivre here. And that one was served by the cook T9XNT. And we've got our garnish at the end. So just a little bit of duck confit on top of it. This will be incredible. This will be so good. Uh, I'm getting hungry here. Uh, and that one was also prepared by X5XP2, as you can see. If I were to order another course, you'll see that the cooks that are preparing the different elements are actually changing at this point. And you can see at the end that everything was assembled by a specific pod, once again, by our specific chef. Now, how do the cooks and the uh, chef communicate together? Well, we've got all those different environment variables that were injected inside our pod. So we can find the address of the different services using the internal DNS, or using uh, environment variables in this case that were injected. So because this is a Node.js application, I can use process.env and I can have the cook service service host as well as the, uh, the port that I can access to communicate with my cooks. So now we have this whole architecture, all the networking is done. And if something breaks, it gets automatically repaired, which is amazing. So this is what Kubernetes does for us, but it can do a lot more. <laughs> And we're not fully done with our restaurant yet, but we're getting to the end. So what's missing now? Well, our dessert, right? So not everything acts like a server. Our pastry chef in our example here is an example of such sort. If you order a piece of cake or some chocolate truffles, uh, the pastry chef doesn't start making them right now. Uh, that would take way too long. So the pastry team will work all day long to produce all those delicious sweets for us. And this is kind of like a cron job, right? So we've got, um, we've got something that runs in the background. So our containers don't need to be a, a server. We typically associated all the different services that will run in our Kubernetes clusters to servers, but it's not necessarily the case. It could be a CLI tool running, it could be a daemon, or in this case, it could be a cron job. So let's take a look at our YAML file. So we'll create a YAML of type cron job. We will also have the metadata just like we did for the others. We'll put in some labels. And for our spec here, we'll, we'll tell uh, the cron job to run every minute in this case. So pretty much the same syntax as when you do a, a Linux or Unix cron job. And then the template will be running a container. So every minute it will actually run this container. So this is my full YAML file for my pastry chef. Now there's one little thing that we'll need more. Now our pastry chef will prepare all the desserts, but they need a way to actually give those desserts to our chef. So once they're done preparing their dessert, they will store everything in the fridge and the chef will be able to extract the desserts from that fridge and do that little, little final touch, put that little flour on top of it and serve it back to you. So this is what persistent volume claims will do for you. So once a pod is terminated, just like in a container, by definition, everything is destroyed. So it destroys everything with it so you'll need a way to persist the data and to share it between the different pods. You can claim some space that was made available to you by your administrator by using a persistent volume claim. So persistent volumes will typically be defined by your system administrator ahead of time. So in this case, I'm just defining one specific uh, persistent volume that is available to my cluster. Uh, it has a space of two gigabytes and it will let you access it in very different modes. Finally, you'll need a persistent volume claim and the persistent volume claim will find a persistent volume that matches the criteria that you specify and make it available to your cluster. Now, the way persistent volumes and persistent volume claims work is a little bit different from one 
cluster to the other or from one service provider to the other. So you'll need to do, read some documentation probably in order to get that enabled on your cluster, but that's pretty much the basics of how it works. So you've got this YAML file. I'm requesting a storage space of one gigabyte in this case. So I will have access to that two gigabyte that was made available to my, by my admin, because that's the closest matching disk space that is available. Now we'll need to add a little thing as well inside of our chef deployment. Inside the spec of our deployment, we'll need to specify that we will use this specific volume in there. So we'll specify the volume mount at the end of me of the definition here. And you can see that I'm mounting a path called slash desserts and it refers to the persistent volume claim that I've just claimed. So let's like go ahead and deploy all of this. So first of all, we'll deploy our fridge using kubectl apply dash F. It's in the kitchen. And I'll deploy my persistent volume. I'll also deploy my persistent volume claim. Now that I have my fridge configured, I'll also deploy my cron job. So now I've got my cron job running and every minute it produces a dessert or it simply adds a file inside my persistent volume claim. And now I'll need to change my chef. So I'll need to use kubectl apply again. And in my kitchen, not cook, but chef. And I have a multi with fridge here. So you can see how the service was unchanged. So I had those multiple objects inside that single file, but the deployment was changed in here. So you can see that it was, it's now configured to something different. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So we get to our restaurant. Once again, we are greeted by our waiter and we can now order a drink. Good. So, and I'm just about due for my drink now. So we can order a drink. We can also order a main course so we can now get access to this delicious duck confit poutine. And we can finally order some dessert. So we get a nice little creme brulee at the end. We can see who prepared it. So we can see it was prepared by our pastry chef when it was prepared. And we can also see that there's zero desserts left. So every minute our pastry chef prepares a new dessert and they are added inside of this persistent volume claim. Now, if I talk for long enough, there probably is going to be another minute that will go in. And we might be able to see, oh, still no desserts left. Hmm. Let's just wait a few seconds here. Oh, and there it is. So we've got another dessert that was prepared by our pastry chef. So it's been over a minute now. So if I try again, you can see that there's no desserts left and every minute there'll be another one available for us. Good, so what do we have deployed? So we've got all of this deployed now. So we've got our Metro D in charge of uh, putting our waiters and making sure that we as customers can actually communicate with those waiters. The waiters can talk to the bartenders using that node port that we've defined. And we've got two bartenders running there. The waiters can also communicate with the chef and the chef will have one pod running and it will be in charge of communicate through the internal DNS to our uh, cooks over there. So we've got those two cooks running as well that can't be accessed by anywhere, can't be accessed by the outside world. It can only be accessed from within our cluster. That's very important. The chef also has access to that fridge up there. And from the fridge, the pastry chef can add some new desserts and the chef can actually get those desserts. So you can see that we've deployed a lot of different things in here. We've got what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different containers running at any given time inside our Kubernetes clusters. If one of them fails, it will be automatically replaced. So there's a lot of different things that we did. So what did we do today? Just a small recap. So we've defined what a cluster is. A cluster is a set of different machines, also called nodes. We've got a master node, which will be in charge of managing the different worker nodes or dispatching the work across those worker nodes. We've got our worker nodes, which will host our pods or our containers. Now our pods are the basic unit in Kubernetes. It's basically equivalent to a container. Uh, we've seen our deployment. The deployment is pretty much a schedule for our pods. So kind of our uh, Metro D, which was in charge of dispatching how many waiters it wanted on the floor. 
we've got our service. Our service is a way to find that specific pod or that set of pods to, to access those, as well as doing all the load balancing for you. We also had our ingress, which was a way to expose our service to the outside world. So the way for our customers to talk to our waiters. We also had node ports that we've introduced. So the node ports were a way to just expose one port inside of our cluster. So we, we've used that node port to do those Ajax requests from our application or from the waiters to the kitchen or to the bartender. We also added cron jobs so that our pastry chef was doing our, those desserts once every minute. We've talked about persistent volumes, which is the available disk blocks, as well as the persistent volume claims, which are mountable disks that we've used. I quickly went over all of those commands. So I've shown you how to apply a new YAML file. So apply a new object into your YAML, your Kubernetes cluster. I've also used get a lot. So kubectl get, so you can get the different components of your Kubernetes cluster. So get all or get pods. Um, also, I did get all with a label as well. So how do you find your different bartenders? So get all label or, or job equals barman in our case. Uh, describe is also very useful. I haven't shown that one, but you can see all the different details of one specific object inside your cluster. You can also see the logs of the different pods that are running in the background. So you can use uh, kubectl logs with a dash F and you'll see the logs of a specific pod running in real time. And also if you need to, if you need to go and see what's going on inside one of your pods, something is not working as you're expecting, you can use kubectl exec uh, interactive mode, uh, specify the name of the pod and run slash bin, uh, bin bash, and you'll be able to actually log into that pod and see what's going on in there. Good, so that was pretty much all of it. Uh, so obviously this was a bit of an oversimplification of a very complex thing, right? So running a restaurant is much more complex than that. I haven't talked about the various roles in the kitchen, like a grill master or a garde manger. And, and I've also left out all the different roles in the dining room, like, like not all waiters are equal. And, and of course, there's important things like a sommelier and so on, which we've left aside for the sake of simplicity. In the same way, we can't really describe all of Kubernetes in a one hour talk. But at least I'm hoping that this will be enough to give you the foundation to get started and to be able to uh, start looking and, and start Googling and, and understanding a little bit more the documentation now that you have an understanding of those building blocks. So a few more resources that I'll leave you with, and they'll all be available into one link at the end. Uh, the official documentation of Kubernetes is very good, although it's a little bit dry. So if you're just getting started with Kubernetes, it might seem a little complex, but most of the definitions that I took during this presentation came straight out of the official documentation. Google Cloud, uh, has a great Kubernetes comic if you want to take a look. It kind of describes Kubernetes and what it does in a very, very simple way. And Fippi and Friends is one of my favorite books. It's basically uh, describing what Kubernetes is to five-year-olds. So it's an illustrated a children's book to Kubernetes. Very, very good read. Definitely take a look at this. So thank you very much. This is what I had today. You can find all those resources at this one URL. So easy URL to slash Kube Kitchen. And that's all I had. So thank you very much. And don't forget, if you want to get in touch with me, Joel underscore underscore Lord is the easiest way. So feel free to reach out on Twitter. Thank you.